You are ready. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Tuli Sigalala, and I am a professional sign language interpreter. Welcome to our conversation. It's been a very interesting journey getting to this point, and I think it just shows the resilience of how technology can get in the way, but then you overcome all of these obstacles to make it happen. I have in sitting with me, and I have our lovely guest, uh, Eugene Mati. And I think the whole purpose of this platform is just to share information and to share knowledge. Um, the reason is that I've been getting a lot of requests from budding interpreters, from clients, and from people that I've been working with along um, the years, just interested about how you become an interpreter and the journey that you have to start with in order to get to where I am. So I titled today's conversation, The Building Blocks for Interpreters, and just how to set the foundation of um, being a professional interpreter. Uh, and I've got our lovely guest here. So Jean, can you just introduce yourself, please? Well, Good afternoon. My name is Jean Mathy. I am a lecturer at Northwest. I used to be a lecturer at uh, the University of the Witwatersrand, and I have an MA in interpreting. And I've been an interpreter for almost 20 years now. It's so interesting, Jean, because it's 20, 2022 now. And I realized when I was just reflecting, I've been doing a lot of reflecting, how did I get here? That when I got my certificate for um, intro introduction to interpreting 1a it was 2012 it's been 10 years and i realized that i've come a long way but you've been so pivotal on my journey and i want to thank you because um lots of people that we started with in class at university with their short courses are not in the industry anymore and i feel like it's it's not an easy journey to have and enjoy the longevity of um the option and calling ourselves professional interpreters i can proudly say that maybe um, two years ago, I, I could actually confidently say I'm professional, but it took a good eight years to build that foundation. And it's not easy. It really does take time. I'm not sure if you can relate. No, it's true. Definitely. I think that there are many people who try to get into interpreting and many who don't. And it's not necessarily because it's such a difficult market to enter. I think uh, there is a little bit of perseverance that has to go into this. Yeah. And I also think that there are many people who think they are interpreters, but they aren't really. And this is an industry where very quickly, if you're not an interpreter, you will know. People will let okay. you know very, very, very quickly that you're not. Um, and the reason for that is simply there are people who uh, have this misconception that they think, okay, I can speak two languages more or less, uh, and therefore I can be an interpreter. Or even worse... I'm a South African, I'm really proud about being South African, and I can speak seven languages, but turns out you can't really speak any one of them really well. Yes. Um, and I think that's one of the first uh, obstacles, really, stumbling blocks that people have, is where they don't really have the required language proficiency. Mm -hmm. And to be an interpreter in South Africa and in many other places in the world, uh, mm -hmm. I think at a very minimum, you need to have a very, very solid foundation in your first two languages one of which ideally should be english and then in south africa if uh, the most obvious would be one of the south african languages or sign languages or, or sign language for that case and then obviously if you're more looking towards the international market english and another uh, international language however the problem is when people think oh my converse i can have a conversation in french so i can be an interpreter no no you can't no you certainly can't um, and I'm glad that you started on that because that's one of the building blocks and that's why I call this the building blocks. When I realized like much later, you know, I didn't get at the beginning why you why facilitators emphasized us learning languages or being fluent. Um, what I get now is that you need two things. You need to be fluent in your languages and you need to master the skill of interpreting. So can we just unpack those two? So it's why do we have to be fluent in the languages? So for example, with me, the language direction that I chose is English to SASL, but like you said, it could be any language. It could be Portuguese, it could be Italian, it could be French, it could be Chivenda, any spoken language plus um, another language, but I chose sign language. Um, what are your language uh, directions and why is it important to be fluent in those languages? What does fluency mean? Well, okay. Thank you very much for that question. The thing is fluency. Yes. What does it mean? It means that you are able to sleep and eat and drink and get angry and love and dream in that language. That is a language that you should be comfortable with 
in any scenario, whether it's informal on the streets, whether it's highly formal in academia, whether it's talking about rocket science or about last night's bri, you have to be able to accommodate any, any conversation in that language. And this is a bit like wanting to play the piano. You will need two hands in order to be a good pianist. Uh, if you don't have two hands, you probably can, but you're not going to achieve great heights. And that's basically it. You need at least two languages. If you don't have those languages and you don't have them fully developed, you're going to run into trouble. You really are going to run into trouble. So that's the concept of fluency that I would like to to talk about. The other thing is then, as you say, the skill of interpreting. Now, there are many little skills that make up the concept of interpreting. And I would say once you have your languages covered, if you know that, okay, fine, I have my two languages and I know them very, very well, then I think the next thing or next two most important things would be the ability to speak properly. And what I mean with that is the confidence to actually be willing to go into an event knowing that people are going to say stuff and I don't know what they're going to say until they've said it. And only once they've said it, immediately I'm supposed to now say the same thing in a different language, making sure that I convey the same feeling, the same intent and the same meaning, uh, which means that I should be able to also think on my feet, think very, very quickly. Yeah. And one of the jokes that I've often seen people make uh, when they talk about interpreting and interpreting skill, it is serious under pressure voice acting uh, because you don't get to be the one who decides on what to say. You have to follow what someone else said, but you can't just say it with this monotonous voice with no emotion or empathy. No, you have to actually act out what the other person said. So it's a bit of like really high stakes voice acting. Uh, so definitely that ability to think on your feet, the ability to speak with confidence, uh, in general, just self-confidence, knowing that you might make a mistake, but you need to fix it and you are going to have people looking at you and it's your responsibility to iron that out. And then I would say also another very, very important skill that an interpreter needs is a very, very good short-term memory. Whether it's going to be, regardless of what kind of interpreting you do, you need to have a very good short-term memory and um, also the ability to take notes if needed. Obviously, for sign language, that's less of an issue because both of your hands are occupied. But for spoken languages, also the ability to take notes uh, to help you with your memory. Mm, fantastic. And I think one thing that I noticed very like early in my journey is that interpreters or the industry is very people centered. So we deal with people. Um, you have to be connected to the community that you serve because language evolves and culture and identity is always changing. So I feel like when you say fluency in language, I feel like um, that's where people find their identity. That's how people can express themselves. You can use language to express poetry, different like thoughts and ideas and philosophies and concepts, um, abstract or even complicated. So if you're not fluent in the language, or if you can just speak a little bit of it, you're not doing justice to it because you don't know which platform you're going to be in. And it's going to be a huge disservice to the people and the clients that you're serving. And then again, it's going to be a big thing for not just one person, but the entire industry, um, even the ones that are doing the, the right thing, that you have to actually work even harder to make up for the one person or the few people that did not take it seriously or didn't prepare for the clients or for the actual platform. So we're dealing with people and people are fluid people have emotions people have identity you don't you, you need to respect people you need to acknowledge them so you also have to have emotional um, awareness and emotional um, intelligence i think i know absolutely uh, a very big part of the fluency in the language obviously is also the cultural awareness and cultural knowledge of that community now obviously different languages uh, some languages are a bit monocultural, other languages are very diverse in their cultures, um, and you have to be well-versed in all of that. You need to be well-versed in what are the behaviors, what are their uh, struggles, what are their, their, their idea of self. Uh, but not only that, also the idea of you are a cultural broker. It's your job to make sure that people of different cultures essentially cross that cultural barrier and that they can communicate as if they were from the same culture. And, and that's something that is quite challenging, uh, especially if you are, let's say, again, you are a French interpreter living in South Africa, 
Well, yes, you may have access to some French people, but you don't have regular access to the culture of the French people in France, in Canada, in the rest of Africa. And by not being within that culture, it is possible that you run the risk of not being culturally aware. Mm -hmm. Now, something else that you also touched on is not only knowing the culture, but being part of the culture and being part of the community. Now, obviously, in the case of sign language, that is extremely important. Uh, The deaf people do need to feel safe and comfortable with their sign language interpreter. That is less important when it comes to spoken languages. Um, No, 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 that isn't very important when it comes to spoken languages. The people don't really need to know you. Um, In many cases, when it comes to spoken language interpreting, uh, if people don't know you, that's actually much better because then you can have that sense of objectivity and neutrality that I'm not here to help you. I'm not here on your side. My job is to make sure that you can communicate with that other person as if you spoke the same language. But I do know that this is not the case always in the sign language community. They want to know you. It's very visual indeed. And then you also touched on mastering the skill of interpreting. So um, with me, I studied sign language, like as a proper degree, I had to like really understand the language and also brush on my English. And then not just that, but also double that up with the interpreting skills. And I remember you were the one who actually um, played a part in teaching us the techniques and the strategies that I still use today. Um, Things like, you know, borrowing and equivalence and omission. And, you know, these are so important that I feel like you have to have some kind of foundation and some kind of um, academic or institutional um, journey or, or support in terms of understanding those things because it's not things that come naturally. Um, I know that in the stressful situations, I definitely go back to uh, borrowing and, and, and making sure that I can have equivalents. And these strategies help me a lot um, in situations where I can't cope. Um, are there any techniques or skills or tips that you can help with people who find themselves in very you know, difficult, stressful situations on the spot? And they have to make a decision as interpreters. Well, okay. A lot of this comes with practice and with experience. Uh, Whenever a new interpreter starts, regardless of how well you may have trained, regardless of how well you may have done in simulations, being in a real situation where what you say actually influences real people's real lives, it puts a completely different pressure on you. And it is okay. You're probably going to screw up a few things here and there. And my advice would be typically, if you are still an interpreter in training, be honest about that. Be honest with yourself and be honest with your clients. Tell them um, that you are still inexperienced and that you are willing to do a job without being paid or that you would prefer doing an interpreting job with an experienced interpreter who can catch up if something goes wrong and, you know, can pick up the slack. Uh, But not only that, who can mentor you. And I think that's probably one of the most important things. Uh, Yes, you need a solid foundation in training, but also a mentorship. You need to have a senior interpreter, someone who's been in the game for a while to help and mentor you. Because, yes, I can tell you, remember to do this and remember to do that. And I can give you a whole long list of things. But in each situation, things are different. Things are unique. And that's where you need the expertise of someone with experience to to catch you when you fall. Um, Mm -hmm. However, I don't want to put aside the fact that the only way to become an interpreter is through formal training. Uh, If we look at our older generation of interpreters, many of them never went through formal training. Mm -hmm. They went through the trial of fire. Um, They Mm -hmm. they really went through a lot of very, very difficult things Mm -hmm. and stumbled over a lot of obstacles to get where they are. And they're amazing at it. And Mm -hmm. again, I think there is no better teacher than experience. Um, in the case of where you said dealing with stress and everything, I think one of the things that interpreters also have to realize is there is no such thing as a perfect interpretation. Uh, Translators who have all the time in the world and all the resources at their disposal, even they make little mistakes here and there. Um, However, what I'm trying not trying to say is that interpreting is by default always inaccurate or is always incorrect. That's not the case. But Mm -hmm. Many people have this idea that interpreting is done by a machine. It's going to be 100% flawless and perfect. And that's never the case. We are people. And as people, we make little mistakes. Uh, However, it's our responsibility to fix those mistakes. And that's where the trick comes in, to do that in such a way that it isn't bothersome for the people listening to us. Do you get nervous or do you still get nervous? I don't know if this is relevant when you interpret. I know there's still some platforms that 
I've done it so many times, but I still get nervous. And I, it reminds me that, you know, um, there's always an opportunity to learn. I don't know if you feel the same way. Okay, as I mentioned, I've been interpreting for years now, and I've been interpreting at a variety of things, very, very high level things in South Africa, and also yeah. some low level things. And the thing is, I still get nervous. I still get nervous before every single job. And I think that's a good thing. I think the moment you stop becoming nervous, when you become complacent, that's when you're in danger of making a fool of yourself because it's like walking a tightrope. You have mm -hmm. to be aware that there is the danger. You have to be aware of the fact that you are influencing people's lives and what you say really matters and makes a difference in someone's life. And the moment you don't care about that anymore, get out you should still be nervous, but there is a difference between being debilitating, you know, having this debilitating stress and having a, a stress that just makes you aware and focused. And I think that's the difference, that comfortable butterflies in your stomach, as opposed to butterflies making you want to vomit. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. Just to go back with the building blocks, I know that uh, my language fluency so my home language is isiZulu but it's not my chosen language for interpreting so very very rarely I don't go to situations or settings where um, the whole meeting is in um, isiZulu you know and I think it's a personal decision I've made because I know it's not my strong my strong language but um, I've learned that over the the years one way of improving or polishing my my language skills is the content that I consume and I think that right now with the options that we've got, um, it's, it's amazing how I've used that to um, improve and to build confidence. So with documentaries that I watch a variety, that's something that I could also maybe give uh, tips to people who are struggling with their language. So watch content that is um, different from what you like. So I find myself watching things that are very strange, like things that are not naturally me. I'm watching, you know, uh, documentaries on Netflix, listening to podcasts about business, reading magazines about science. It's not something I actually go by, but if I'm waiting in the queue and I read something interesting, then that sticks in my mind and you never know where you'll be in a situation where you'd actually have to like go into your memory box and now pull out that file and then remember that concept or that you know um that terminology so it's a very big tip even with music as well you know um another thing that i also learned is subtitling so when i watch content i read um the captions it helps with spelling you never know where you have to like you know remember spelling of a place or a person but i'm not sure if these are some of the tips that you've used just to polish and also build your word bank uh definitely i completely agree with that as a language professional in regardless of what it is that you're doing whether it's translation whether it's subtitling whether it's voiceovers whether it's interpreting if you call yourself a language practitioner then you should aspire to at least try to learn one new word every day and what you mentioned actually is, is a great thing, is a great way to do that. Uh, yes, watch television, listen to radio, mm -hmm. uh, be aware of what's happening in pop culture, read the sections of the newspaper that you're interested in, but also read the sections you're not normally interested in. And when you come across a word that you're, you don't know, or that you're not familiar with, go look it up. Um, mm -hmm. But even something as silly as while you're driving on the road, look at billboards, look at the advertisements on there and see... Oh, if I had to say that in my other language, how would I have done that? And mm -hmm. if you can't think of something at the, you know, right there and then try to remember it when you have the chance, look it up. And I would also say one of the most useful, um, although it sounds really silly, ways of, of strengthening your vocabulary is to not just do it passively. Um, okay. And I don't know whether you remember this, but there's Daniel Gilles' Uh, gravitational model of linguistic availability, where a big part of that is when you learn a new word or when you try to interpret something, don't just do it in your head. Physically do it with your mouth. Say the word uh, because that strengthens its presence in your memory much stronger and much better than just simply looking at it or just looking at the dictionary or just saying it in your head. Actually say and speak, speak the words out loud. It really does make quite a big difference. The same thing goes for even just improving your language abilities. Um, let's say, for example, you are, well, as you said, you're, you're a Zulu speaker. Uh, try to watch Zulu on television, listen to Zulu on the radio, and also try to mimic the accents of a variety of different speakers so that in whichever situation you are, that you can adapt to that situation. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then just another thing I'm interested in now we're post COVID. I'm not sure if you've seen over the past two years, 
uh, a change in the landscape in the industry uh, i know that you are more like spoken but um has it affected you and do you feel like going forward the future of interpreting has changed more opportunities or have things really um taken a turn for a very interesting um direction in the future because i know that i've made decisions uh, regarding my career based on COVID that i never thought would happen but because of that it sort of like launched me to get out of my comfort zone mm. I think COVID has definitely influenced the world and so many different industries. I don't think COVID has had any effect on whether interpreting would be used more or less, but I think the way in which interpreting is used has changed dramatically, where in the past interpreters would always be on site and interpret at the place. It has now become reasonably commonplace for interpreters to stay at home and interpret via mm -hmm. Zoom or Skype or MS Teams or whatever the case may be. And I think a very big important part of an interpreter's training and toolkit nowadays has to be the ability to know the various different platforms uh, like Zoom, like MS Teams and those kind of things and how to deal with yourself there and also to be aware of a safe space in your house where you can interpret without children and dogs running around and with a washing machine in the background, um, that sort of thing. So yes, I think COVID has definitely changed the way in which we interpret. Obviously not everything. Conferences still happen. People still go to court. Crime will never stop. So yeah. there will always be court interpreting. So uh, many things have returned to the way they were. Yeah. But I think very big high level conferences uh, that are now broadcast over um, Zoom and MS Teams and even Discord sometimes, uh, the interpreters will need to be available to interpret on these platforms as well. I think you are going to do yourself a great disservice if you say, you know what, now I don't like technology. If I can't be there, I'm not going to interpret. Well, fine, you're still going to get jobs, but you're not going to get all of the jobs. Mm, I definitely agree. Um, and I think that it's also adjusting. I think that it's something that you have to um, get confidence with as well. I know that it does take time. I know that with us, especially with sign language interpreting, with the presidential addresses, um, you always somehow, maybe the spotlight was put on interpreters. Perhaps this is the reason why I got so many requests um, and attention about the industry, um, even though I wasn't the one interpreting, but there was a lot of conversation and intrigue about who's this person and how's it happening. And I really hope that these conversations can really uh, spread the knowledge and spread the awareness about what actually interpreting as a whole, as, as an industry, and regardless of the language that you're doing as a professional that you can be a, a professional interpreter but also it takes time and it's not easy you don't just land up in a platform um it takes years and years and serious commitments and dedication to actually build a reputation and be professional um yeah so i'm not sure if there's anything that you'd like to add um with just the conversation no well first of all thank you very much for this opportunity to be speaking here about this and i think if there's one thing that i can say is if you want to be an interpreter or any kind of language practitioner, go for it. There is work, there are many opportunities, but do it, as you said, with commitment. Do it with the sense of responsibility that you know uh, you're going to be influencing people because no language practice is not done for people. And if you are not the kind of person who's going to commit to that, if you're not going to be the person who constantly strives to improve yourself, then don't do it because you're going to be doing a disservice to the people you work with. But not only that, you're also going to do damage to the profession. You're going to hurt the people who are actually currently there um, and we will boycott you. It's, it's, it's not a good idea to do that. Um, no, the thing is, and as you have I've seen, if an interpreter doesn't do well, people tell them, listen, you're, you're not doing this. Uh, you know, this is not the level that we want you to be doing this at. So either go get better or go away. And it's all about accountability. I think we need those gatekeepers and whistleblowers. We definitely need those because um, what we struggle with, especially with, with sign language, that's not really regulated. So it's very easy to um, hide or to disappear in the loops. And you, you can't monitor each and every um, person that keeps popping up in the industry. So the nice thing about it is that eventually, you know, uh, your own work will speak for itself and people will catch you out. But unfortunately, when that happens, it's like, oh my goodness, now everyone is in the same boat. And we'll have to work really hard to make sure that we uplift the name and the profession and the standard of interpreting, you know, but I definitely agree that you can go and be anything that you want to be. Um, I hope that um, 
even you, I think you learned a couple of things that if you really want to be a professional um, interpreter or language practitioner, just go for it, work hard, put in the work, study. I am a big advocate of studying. I believe in going all the way. I think it's just me, the academic side of me, but um, even with the language, study and learn the language, even though it's your home language, but find out the structure, find out the rules of the language, you know, speaking it and understanding the framework or the phonetics or the syntax behind it is something so different, but also don't rely so much on the theory. You need to need the practical side of it as well. And the practical side is the scary side, but it's it's where you cut your teeth because that's, it builds your character, it builds your confidence, you can get a bit of money and you can enjoy different um, experiences and you can get um, good network opportunities with that. So I really, really appreciate that. And I think I've enjoyed that career from the beginning up until now. Um, I feel like there's a lot more work that has to be done. I feel like there are more opportunities that can be explored. And I really look forward to collaborating with you and just finding out how we can spread the word um, as language practitioners and just show the good side of it. It's a very rare and a very hidden industry. People don't get it. And I feel like every encounter that we get is an opportunity to spread awareness and to change the narrative and the thinking of um, the misconceptions of interpreters. Mm. Absolutely. No, I do agree. Getting the word out, uh, not only about the career as such, you know, to recruit new members to become language practitioners, but also, you know, to educate people on how to use us. Many people yeah. have bad experiences with translators and interpreters and those kind of yeah people simply because they don't know what to do with us. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to use us correctly. Um, so yes, knowledge, education is power. Sure, thank you so much. Um, how do people get a hold of you? People want to maybe, um, you talked about mentorship. I don't know if, you, if that's available for you because people always come knocking on my door. But if people want to know more about the industry or where they can get formula education, you didn't mention that you're a lecturer. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Where can you guide them on the information or resources that they get a hold of, please? There are many organizations and institutions that can be very useful in this regard. I think uh, one of the first places to start is with the South African Translators Institute. Um, that is if you need to use an interpreter or if you want to be put into contact with interpreters, but also a variety of uh, nonprofit organizations and even some for-profit organizations. And then obviously universities where interpreting is presented as a course or as a degree. Um, I think we should put some links with this video to help people to get into contact with these people. Um, I will also put my details down here as well. Oh, definitely. really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything else on my side, but I really appreciate your time, Eugene. Thank you for the knowledge always, you know, and I really hope that whoever's watching this, if you can just share your comments, what do you think? What are your experiences as an interpreter? Um, are you looking into becoming a professional? And just share your comments with us and we'd really like to engage and have the conversation with you. Thank you so much for your time and we're looking forward to more conversations.